All right. Well, welcome everybody once again to FRC leadership training. Uh, I'm very happy to see all of you here. And I think everybody on the line is a member of the Husky Robotics team. Uh, if not, welcome. I'd like to start by thanking Mr. Schmidt for all of his help with this presentation. We worked as a team over the past few weeks to develop and focus the content on what we think will provide to all of you the most benefit. Tonight, we're going to talk about the ideas and tools in this book called Crucial Accountability. The team captains requested this after I introduced the concept last year. This book is from the same group that brought us Crucial Conversations, so you will hopefully recognize the parts that overlap. We do our best to only remind you of those parts and not fully reteach them so that we can focus on the accountability aspects. Much like crucial conversations, you will want to begin with the end in mind when you are working on accountability with another person. You want to know what you want for them, for you, for the relationship, and you want to know what you don't want as an outcome. And just like in a crucial conversation, if you notice it going off the rails, verbally pause the conversation and see if you can start over vocally answering these questions. And crucial conversations and accountability are both long-term investments in our team. They're not shortcuts. You will each need to do this long range work to be able to benefit from it. Trust and therefore culture hurts when accountability is lacking. So we want to work at getting this right. We note trust here and we'll focus on it more later because team culture is built on all of the relationships in the team. And the foundation of relationships is trust. Transparent relationships undergird serious teamwork. Here are the main points we're going to address tonight. About halfway through is where we get to the accountability plan. So we ask you to read the article about the fundamental attribution error. Speaking from personal experience, when you make the fundamental attribution error and assume that the other person didn't meet their commitment because they're a bad person, it's like you've told yourself a victim or a villain story from last week. After that, it's really easy to have your motives shift and you want to punish the other person for not following through on their commitments. Very quickly, you will find yourself putting the other person in their place for being the lazy, no good person that you have told yourself that they are. But what does that do for your relationship with them? Will you be respected and welcomed by others after you berate them? If you were the person who lost the argument, would you feel good about giving this team all of your free time? So if we come across an accountability issue with a team member and we fall into the fundamental attribution error, we will likely first think that the person is not motivated to do a good job. Or maybe we'll think way outside of that box and think that they don't have the ability. But even then, we will miss all of these other possibilities. So the six sources of influence are grouped into motivational influences and ability influences. Each of these is subgrouped into personal, social, and structural influences. With these simple examples, we hope that you can see the similarities and differences across a single row or column. So for instance, personal motivation, I just don't wanna change a light bulb today. And personal ability, I can't reach the box of bulbs. It's too high in the cabinet. Okay, that's not my problem, but hey, that that whole, it's personal. It's, it's me, I can't do it, or I don't want to do it, right? But with motivation, we see a lot of things, personal, social, structural. I don't feel like it for personal. My friends all say it's better to study in the dark, social, 
right? The the impact from from the other people that I interact with, or or structural motivation. It's not my job to change the bulb. It's my parents' job. Those are the rules they've put down. That's the structure, right? Whereas on the ability side of structural, we don't have any new bulbs in the cabinet. They just aren't there, so I can't do it, right? How would you feel about berating somebody and then finding out that, well, we didn't have any of the things that we had asked them to get, and so it wasn't their fault. So hopefully this helps you to understand uh, these, these six sources of influence, the personal, the social, and the structural for motivation and for ability. So we're gonna take some time for a breakout and we'd like to get uh, each, each group to think about at least two of those examples and come up, sorry, two of those sources of influence and then come up with an example uh, for those two items. And then we'll have some groups report out um, on those make sure to have somebody chosen to do the report out. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, do you have the ability to drop us into those breakout rooms? Almost there. Just spreading out the mentors so we don't all end up in the same one. <laughs> so that we get flat. All spread out. Mr. Schmidt, can you send the slide link in the chat, or did you? Uh, I'll, I will send the handout in just one moment. No problem. Let me do that. Thank you for that reminder, Nikhil. Yes, because people will need that. Here, I'll do that now so before I forget. All right, so click on that link and open that now, because that will open up all the handouts um, that you'll need this evening. And... Need to make one more adjustment here. All right, I think we've got it. All right, here we go. Um, are we ready, Mr. John? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Is this a, this is a five minute one, correct? Yes, correct. Ah, and I will clarify this from last time. So um, when you get the 60 second warning, you still have 60 seconds and it's that's part of your five minutes. It's okay to use that. We just wanna give you time to wrap up your discussion in a less rushed format. So I just wanna be clear about that. So, all right, here we go. Yes, yes, I do want to mute myself. There's a countdown timer in the upper right hand corner that does not start at five. It starts at four. It does, yeah. I didn't that realize confusing? That, okay. that was confusing. <laughs> I can't give the one minute warning until that expires, if that makes sense. Yeah, understood, understood. Yeah. All right. Well, I failed on that one. Sorry so. for the confusion. <laughs> but I wasn't the first one back either, so that's all right. We will have it figured out by week five. <laughs> okay. So is, uh, is everyone back? Everyone is back. All right. My apologies. Glad to know I'm not the only one who has these problems. Thank you, Mrs. Kama. All right. So the six sources of influence. Uh, this is going to go fun. Here we go. Uh, so I'd like to get a few people. Um, so we're we're going to we're going to get one example from a group for each of these different things. So if there's a group that had uh, motivation, personal personal motivation uh, as something that they talked about, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, Connor, tell us about a personal motivation issue. Uh, so we thought that a personal motivation issue would be something like they don't really want to machine the part. They just rather like do something else maybe. Okay. 
Very good. Um, and Faiz, I'm going to move on to, does anybody have a personal ability story to share? And if that's still you, Faiz, then go ahead. Yeah, so our group said something about how you may not know how to like start machining or something about maybe you feel like you can't machine because I guess like you broke some of your arms, something like that, but you don't have the ability to physically machine. So that's why you would have like a personal ability against machining. So yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, let's move on to social motivation. Do we have a social motivation? Andy. Uh, we talked about any given task, you might want to maybe work with your friends. Um, so if you're, you know, don't have a chance to work with people, you know, you might not feel motivated socially to participate in that project, even if it needs to get done. All right. Very good. Uh, let's go on to social ability. All right, Lulu. We just said if you already had another task to do, you won't have the ability to do take on another task if your time's already being taken up with something else. Very good. Excellent. All right. Um, moving on to structural motivation. Frank. Um, yeah, so we talked about like, for example, like if you need to do something, right, but like, like you won't do it until like it got approved by, for example, your coach. So that would be like a structural motivation because like if the pro if your coach doesn't approve you, then you then you just don't start at all. Okay, okay. Um, and let's move on to structural ability. Declan. So he said maybe if there was miscommunication either like between sub teams or between like a lead and their members that people might not know that there was a task to be done so they wouldn't have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. You guys came up with a lot of good different ideas. Thank you very much for putting that effort into that. All right. Um, let's move on to how, as servant leaders, can we address these six sources of influence? So we're going to start with make it motivating, and then we'll move on to make it easy for ability influences. So most team members do not attend the sprint planning meetings and are not necessarily aware of the complex interdependencies of each sub team to the other sub teams. They might not see how their actions can help the team meet the team's goals. In other words, they might not feel needed because they don't see where their part is in this huge play. In this case, your job is to help the other person to understand these potential outcomes that they can't see and why it is important for them to do the task so that they can see how their actions can directly help the team. This will help them to develop the motivation to find ways to get the task done, even if they run into problems. And check for their understanding. Try another example if they don't understand. But stop in the name of love. Don't keep piling it on. As soon as they understand, your job of providing examples is done. And yes, so is my singing career. So now you know the two main skills of make it motivating. They apply to situations where the person is having problems with personal, social, or structural motivation. Mr. Schmidt and I are about to provide you with an example conversation. And after that, we will go into breakout rooms and you'll have the opportunity to figure out how to apply to that example. So in this example, we're going to introduce a crucial accountability situation that is going to play out over five different acts. This first one is the longest. It will set the stage for the following examples, and it covers the make it motivating skills that we just presented. So, Mr. Schmidt, do you have, a, oh, 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 do you have your hat? All right, there we go. 
Mr. Schmidt, do you have a moment? Sure. I noticed this afternoon that it appears that you didn't update the Trello card for assembling the mystery mechanism. I just came from room 116 and they're trying to find the gusset used to rivet the mystery mechanism to the robot. Oh, I know where that is. I put it on the assembly RSU last night. I'll get it right now. <sighs> Here's another example of Mr. Schmidt being too lazy to do the right thing. He's always so lazy. Wait a minute, that's not really true. There's probably some other factors that led to this. Well, we'll find out. All good now. Thank you for getting the gusset. I would still like to discuss the team's expectations for leaving sufficient breadcrumbs for a task at the end of the meeting and how it appears you didn't do that last night with respect to the mystery mechanism. Um, okay, I guess. You know, a lot of people don't update Trello. I agree with you that others don't consistently update Trello. I'm working with them as well. Right now, I would like to focus on why updating Trello is so important. Okay. As the project manager, I review all of the Trello cards before the meeting to create a high level plan. If a card isn't updated, I don't know the status of that story or task and I can't effectively plan the meeting. As a result, other tasks may end up getting blocked or unexpectedly delayed. The team isn't as productive without an effective plan. Oh, I didn't realize that you read the cards before each meeting. That does make it more important. And it's not just about me. Today, you are busy review, revising chairman's essays, which is really important. As a result, others are working on the mystery mechanism. Without the Trello card updated, they had to ask around until they found people who understood the current status. They didn't want to interrupt you since you're working on chairman's today. Yeah, last night I forgot that I would be working on chairman's today and thought I would still be working on the mystery mechanism assembly. So I didn't think updating Trello was that important since I knew what to do next. Well, that is understandable. Plans often change. You may miss a meeting unexpectedly or be pulled into a higher pr priority task. Our schedule this year is really aggressive. We need to be efficient when it means, which means everyone needs to be able to quickly figure out the status of any task. Yeah, that makes sense. Back to the gusset. While you were able to find it quickly, what if you weren't here today? Right, yeah, unexpected absence again. Or what if another team member found the gusset on the assembly RSU and moved it onto a shelf in holography to make room to work on another task? And then you wouldn't have been able to find it quickly. Yeah, that's, that's happened in the past. Or what if another team member mistakes it for a gusset for a different mechanism and tries to use it to assemble that mechanism? That's a bit of a stretch as it's a fairly unique part, but I see your point. Or what if Mr. Jurup makes a run to the scrap metal center and grabs the gusset for recycling since it's not in a tote and- Okay, okay, I get it. That's the end of the first act. Mr. John really didn't stop in the name of love, did he? Take a moment and remember the conversation you just heard in the issue of not noting the next step to be done on the Trello card. My character was trying to make the invisible visible. I was trying to help Mr. Schmidt understand why updating Trello with the next step is so critical. For this breakout room, choose one of these four statements and come up with the type of member for who this could be an effective way to make the invisible visible. These will all work well for different members. So we really want you to focus on explaining why you think one of these could help a particular fictional member. And remember that when the time runs out in the upper right hand corner, you still have a minute to talk and to choose somebody to report out. All right, we're ready about five minutes. All right, and I, I think I, uh... A couple new people have joined, so click in the latest link in the chat to open up the um, breakout room handouts. And I will get this open. Here we go. Thank you.
Okay. So, uh, we'd like to hear out from uh, some hello? some team hello? that. Hello. 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 We'd like to hear out from some team that uh, that chose the first one. Uh, the you don't remember exactly what you had to do next. You end up going down a wrong path. All right, Bryce. So we discussed that this applies to someone who is involved in multiple projects at, and then that they prioritize something over something else and that they ended up forgetting about what had gone on in one of them, thus going down the wrong path in the next meeting. Excellent, excellent. Um, for the, the one below that, people lose their respect for you. Uh, Nikhil, do you have that one? Uh, I was thinking um, for the second one, um, yeah, and have things labeled and put away. Sorry, I had to reread it. Um, one one reason for this uh, is uh, because the reason that you don't have things labeled and put away is maybe because you got too close to um, cleanup time, too close, too close to nine o'clock the night before, um, and you, you just you didn't have the time. Something got stuck and you had to fix it before cleanup time. Um, so therefore you have, uh, you didn't have the time to share the next step or label things properly. Okay, all right. So that could be anybody who <laughs> wasn't managing their time. All right, very good. All right, so the time is wasted during the sprint meeting one. Uh, Srivasa, do you have that one? Yeah, uh, our group said that we thought this member was somewhere in between a new member and a team lead. So more on the experience side, since they started taking up like a project like chairman's, like Bryce said, they seem to prioritize one thing over the other. And we said time is wasted during the sprint meeting because they didn't upload to Trello. So if they were to miss a meeting, like I uh, said in the example, they'd be wasting a lot of people's time, a lot of people's time that could stop other processes because they could be involved. They could be in the middle of doing something or they could be working on a larger project and they might be the reason that they have to stop that project for that week. Okay. And then for the last one, since we couldn't get the feature working on time, Elena, is your hand up for that one? Yeah. Um, well, obviously it could be with anybody because, you know, we all want to do good in competition, but more specifically, probably if somebody was on drive team and, you know, they did something that probably didn't contribute to the completion of the feature, um, talking about how much practice the drive team gets, you know, is a motivating factor for them. All right, cool. Thank you all very much for for thinking through that. Um, the the point of this, and hopefully what came across, was to get you thinking about why you might choose one explanation over another to make the invisible visible for any particular person. Uh, so that you don't end up having to pile it on like Mr. John did. All right, so next. <laughs> Let's turn now to ability issues. Making other people's jobs easy is the main focus of servant leaders. And remember, this isn't a motivation issue. This is an ability issue. So we're not trying to encourage people to do painful, tedious, or obnoxious work. But instead, we're trying to find ways to make the work less painful, less tedious, less obnoxious. When you've determined what the problem or source of the ability influence is, just say to them, you've been working on this. What do you think should be done? If you start out with providing an answer, you may both overlook a better solution. That's what the power bias is. That's what you want to, to not enter in. You will also steal from them the ability to practice finding solutions. Remember the game this year and the game next year. So agree and support their idea if it looks like it will work. Partner with them in brainstorming if you have some major concerns about the idea. And then you want to gain buy-in. Let's, let's take a look, look at that for a moment. A solution that is tactically inferior, but has the full commitment of those who implement it, may be more effective than one that is tactically superior, 
but is resisted by those who have to make it work. In other words, don't fall into that trap of wanting the other person to pick your idea because you think it is the best. It will certainly not be the best idea if it doesn't get done. It's important to note that like in crucial conversations, you may find yourself needing to repeat. But here the issue is more that the person may not feel comfortable telling the whole story at the beginning. So after you have worked your way through the problem, determining the source, making it motivating or making it easy, you may need to check, well, you do need to check if there are any other roadblocks stopping them from completing the task. There might be an ability problem. You might not know until you get curious and ask them, is there anything that you know now that could keep you from getting the task done? But asking that question will not get you the answer if you have not showed compassion and built trust with the other person. This time we're gonna have a breakout before we do an example. What does it feel like when someone asks you for your ideas on how to solve a problem and then totally ignores your ideas and tells you what to do? Or they have the correct answer in mind and they hint until you get it. How did you feel? What was awkward about that? What could you have done to help the conversation go in a better direction? And what can you do to not put someone else through this? All right, so we're gonna go into breakout rooms and hopefully come up with some good conversations. All right, here we go. Okay, well, welcome back everyone. So what does it feel like to these different questions individually? Um, Raj, the first question. What's it feel like when they totally ignore your ideas and tell you what so to do? Just talking about how like, um, when someone asks you for ideas and then just disregards them, it makes you feel like useless and that like they're just asking you for the heck, for just like to like for the heck of it, just to ask you for your opinion. But like if you're the leader, to not put someone else through this, like if you think that you're the only person with the right ideas, like you have to consider other people's like kind of skill levels. Um, like if they're maybe more of a beginner, you have to like be empathetic and remember that they might not have as much insight on a topic as you do. And you have to think about it from that perspective. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the next one, if they have the correct answer in mind and they hint until you get it. Uh, Noor, is that you? Yep, that's me. Um, I think that can feel obviously at the beginning kind of unmotivating. Um, but I think it's important to allow other people to have some creative leeway with that and not kind of take the correct answers because it can give more um, liberty to the team. And also it can come up with new and better ideas that somebody who is trying to give the correct answer didn't think of originally. Okay. All right. And then if you've gone through something about like that, how did you feel? What was awkward? Uh, and if I can get somebody other than Raj, because you just answered this one, Lara. Um, I guess it feels kind of awkward when somebody asks you for your opinion when they already know the answer, because then you're kind of thinking, well, what was the point in you asking me in the first place if you already have an idea and want to go ahead with that? So I guess coming from like a personal standpoint also happens to other people. It just feels kind of out of place and really awkward if that when that happens. Okay. All right, the next question, what could you have done to help the conversation go in a better direction? Declan. Um, so what our group said was you could try to get them to engage more in the conversation, like say, why don't we talk about the pros and cons of these two ideas or just kind of confront them, not like aggressively, but just maybe say like, hey, I, I don't really feel like you're paying attention to me or listening to my ideas right now because a lot of the times it may not be on purpose by the person who's ignoring you. They might just be like thinking about something else or not really paying attention. Yep. All right. 
And then the last one, what can you do to not put someone else through this? Alex? Uh, we just talked about having like an open environment. So like everybody feels safe speaking up just in case they do feel like their idea is like pushed down, they're able to speak up about it. And then also just making sure like you're actually like caring about other people's ideas and you're not just asking just for the point of asking. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you to all of you um, for for those answers and, and also to all of you who didn't participate in the answering part, but participated in your conversations in your groups, because we want you to, to think this thing through, understand what it's like to be on the other side of your eyeballs, um, see, see what the, the rest of the world feels. All right, very good. I, I can feel the empathy emanating from you all. Well, here we are now in act two, now that you've, thought through the awkwardness and pain that can happen when someone doesn't know the skills of make it easy. Let's take a look at a conversation that puts the make it easy skills to good use. So we pick up the conversation in an alternate universe where Mr. John knew to stop in the name of love and Mr. Schmidt is now motivated, but not sure how to proceed. Got your hat there, Mr. Schmidt. Get into character. So what should I do differently? Since you are the one who has to clean up at the end of meetings and make sure there are enough breadcrumbs for the next day, I'm more interested in what you think you should do. I guess it's not that hard. I should just update Trello and put the parts in the tote. It sounds easy, but we know that it's not. We identified a couple of influences that made it challenging to do yesterday. That's true. In terms of updating Trello, I'm too busy with homework when I get home after robotics. I don't think I can reliably update Trello after the meeting. It is good to be honest with yourself. What's another option? Suppose I could set an alarm now for 8.40 every night. That would give me and everyone else plenty of time to update Trello and put everything away where it belongs. That sounds like a workable plan. If you share this plan with the whole team, you can all hold each other accountable when the alarm goes off. That's a good idea. Okay. Is there anything else that you know of that could cause this to not work for you? Not that I can think of. Okay. That's the end of the second act. And Congratulations, you have now opened your mind to the first half of crucial accountability. This knowledge will help you get past the fundamental attribution error of thinking that a person is lazy, incapable, or evil. These skills will help you remove the roadblocks of motivation and ability like any good servant leader should do. This will take practice. Remember back to the prior two weeks and the definition of compassion as empathy in action. Action requires work. You're going to have to put in the work of trying, sometimes failing, and trying again. And remember, being transparent about failure is one of the strengths of a team player. Now we can learn about how to make a good accountability plan. The plan is very straightforward. The first three steps, who does what by when, are very easy to lay out. Remember to be specific. For instance, in the does what step, make sure you both agree on what done looks like. Is it that the prototype has been built or that it has been tested? Maybe the list of parts has to be not only prioritized, but also communicated to the person responsible for the next step. And by when generally means a date and a time. Let me provide a counter example. Does done by Thursday mean it will be done before the meeting starts on Thursday? or by the end of the meeting on Thursday. It might mean two very different things to the people in the conversation. So get rid of the confusion and specify the day and the time. For example, have it done Wednesday by 5.30 so that you can report out at the supper meeting. Then you agree to a follow-up method and summarize the plan. We'll talk more about the follow-up soon. Let's focus for a moment on summarizing the plan. 
It simply means that after the who does what by when and follow up have been discussed, you will want to put it all together in one statement to check for agreement. For example, so we said that you would inventory all of the shop bot bits and post the list on the open Trello card by the end of Saturday's meeting. We also said that you would check in with me Saturday at lunch to let me know how it is going. Do you agree with this plan? That's all it is, a summary with a question for their agreement. Now, let's focus on this follow-up part. We all want to believe that if we have had the conversation and agreed to the plan, then the other person is gonna have no problem getting the work done on time to specification. But we have also all learned today that there's a framework for the things that we have always known can get in our way. We may not have had the words for it previously, but many of us have known that our motivation and ability are affected by personal, social, and structural influences. Given this personal reality, we have to recognize that these six sources of influence are going to continue to affect the person even after the accountability conversation. That is why we need to follow up. But following up with someone can be tricky. If you have too many follow-ups, they might feel like you're micromanaging them. Not enough follow-ups, or worse, if you forget to follow up with them, they could feel that you don't care. That is why we need to also agree with the other person on the frequency of the follow-up, the timing. Note that some tasks are small and can be done in a relatively short time frame. They only need one follow-up. Some are longer and may lend themselves to more frequent status checks, similar to your project management reviews. Lastly, there may be reasons why the person assigning the task should follow up, and there may be reasons why the person who owns the task should perform the follow up. That's why we need to also agree with the other person on how to follow up. So if you're nervous that the task person combo is going to run into problems from any of the six sources of influence, then propose a check up. You own this checkup, so you need to make sure that you remind yourself in a proven way to do the checkup. Make an alarm on your phone, a calendar appointment, a Trello card with a reminder, whatever works for you. If you are feeling more confident that the task person combo is now going to run more smoothly, ask them to check back with you. Either way, a check in or, or sorry, a check up or a check back. Make sure that you build agreement with the follow up. You do not want to force an agreement on which one you're going to do. Because as you don't learn in physics, force equals make angry. All right, act three. We joined the action right after last time when they had finished discussing the who does what by when. I'd like to check up on how this is working for you during the next meeting. I don't think that is needed, but okay. It's always good to close the loop and make sure our plan works as expected. Well, that makes sense. Okay, let me summarize to make sure we both are on the same page. You are going to set a repeating alarm for 840 for each meeting starting with today's meeting. The alarm will remind you to start the mental and physical cleanup which includes both updating Trello with enough breadcrumbs that another team member can pick up the work if you aren't here, and getting parts labeled and in totes. Correct. That's the end of the third act. The accountability plan is very straightforward. And the example you just heard was relatively easy. But this normally does not happen. It doesn't happen on student teams, and it doesn't happen in corporate America. So we would like you to take some time in your breakout rooms and discuss the following two questions. What is going to be personally difficult or awkward about developing and communicating the accountability plan? And what can you do to overcome your personal difficulties or awkwardness? 
and maybe that involves other people. We're gonna give you a couple more minutes to discuss this so that you can hear each other's issues as well as your own. I'd go for seven minutes. All right, so six minutes and a one minute countdown? Yep. Perfect. Thank All you right. for specifying. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So, um, like to hear from from a few people, uh, a few teams on this whole accountability plan. Um, Anaya, what do you what did you guys talk about? So, in our group, we decided that the most awkward or difficult part is definitely following up. Um, just because following up can be perceived in many different ways. It can be perceived as like a friendly check-in, but it can also be perceived as micromanaging, um, which is not necessarily the case. It's usually just to make sure that everyone has the resources that they need um, and that the, the whole, like the tasks is being done just to benefit the entire team. Um, so, uh, we decided that establishing right from the beginning that, hey, we will have these weekly check-ins or these daily check-ins, just like how it's very clear that we have sprint planning meetings every week, um, helps um, get rid of that awkwardness um, and just lays it all out on the table that this is going to happen. It's, it's just to make sure that you have everything that you need. It's not personal. Okay, very good. Thank you. Tyler. Um, one of the difficult things my group said was um, like if you had a fight with someone and I had to go tell them to like organize how to organize their time management and stuff like that it could be quite difficult so that yeah that would be quite difficult so you can like overcome that difficulty by using what we learned last week uh, to resolve that conflict and then coming back to robotics and then um, kind of talking it through all right, very good. Thank you. Samika. Um, our group said that one of the most difficult or awkward things is being like forcing the agreement because obviously we wanna make it clear to them what exactly like they need to get done and we wanna make sure like they know how important it is, but like we're not gonna like force it upon them because we don't wanna seem like rude or inconsiderate or we're not trying to make them feel like subordinate. So we wanna make sure that like um, to overcome that, like we're just being really clear about what needs to get done. And we talked a lot about how like clarity is really, really important. Like our intention is not to make you feel bad. Like we just wanna make sure that everything's getting done on time. And like, if you have any questions, like you can come to us and like, we're here to help you, but we do wanna get everything done. Okay, Nikhil, thank you, Samika. I think adding on to Samika's point of clarity, clarity not only finds its way into um, kind of how how you approach the student, but also the topic itself, the accountability itself. So something that we talked about is um, being specific with and what you mean or what you what the plan is. Um, and a great way to do that is to have the person that you're talking to. Let's just say um, I was I created a plan with someone else, making sure that student uh, or member repeated the plan um, because although I may have an understanding of what the plan should be, um, that person may not have the same understanding and it's good to, to work that out to make sure that there are no further difficulties. Okay, thank you very much. And my apologies to Suhyun and Andrea. Um, I'm realizing I'm running tight on time. So we're going to move along. Uh, thank you all very much for sharing. All right, we're gonna talk about what happens when things go wrong? And we talked about this a little bit in, in my breakout room. Uh, this whole script that we gave you sounds great, but what happens when the person starts adding on other problems? You know, they start to sound like excuses, but they aren't. They're emergent problems. Perhaps you haven't explored all of the problems well enough. Perhaps they didn't feel it was safe to share until they're staring into the possibility of having to commit to getting something done. So you need to be focused and flexible. 
flexible to be able to take on a new item, but focused to be able to prioritize and deal with the issues or the pattern of issues that the other person is bringing up. A violation of trust is the highest priority emergent issue. Remembering back to the introduction, trust is the foundation for all of the relationships on the team and for team culture. When trust is broken, it quickly affects relationships and can start to pull apart the entire team culture. If it's not addressed immediately, then it will quickly get out of hand and your goals will be out of reach. To address it well, you have to lean heavily on the strengths of a team player to ensure that you begin with the end in mind and use compassion when discussing a violation of trust. Remind yourself that you what you really want for both of you and what you don't want to happen as a result of what you are about to say. Pause, think, and then talk. When discovering broken trust, it's really easy to tell yourself a clever victim, villain, or helpless story. You'll need to be aware of that potential and learn to look for your emotions coming out. Now, remember the slide from last week? It applies here too. So watch for emergent issues in the accountability conversation to turn crucial where suddenly you, they, or both of you are acting out your feelings because you told yourself a clever story based on something that you saw or heard. If they are acting out, then you can help them to retrace their path. Remember the ask, mirror, paraphrase, and suggest skills from last week's Crucial Conversations training. If you or both of you are acting out, you may need some space to cool down and plan before restarting the conversation. You're likely going to have to use the apologize, contrasting, and retracing your path skills from last week. So we rejoin the action at the next meeting, act four, after Mr. John's alarm reminded him to check up on Mr. Schmidt. Afterwards, we're going to ask you to analyze how they built trust back into their relationship. Well, it looks like everything was put back last night where it belongs. The team got a quick start today on their tasks. Yep, all good now. I also noticed that it appeared that Trello wasn't updated for the mystery mechanism assembly story. I also noticed that you're bothering me again and keeping me from assembling the mystery mechanism. We all know what we're doing. Do you have to make a big deal of me not updating Trello yesterday? My primary concern at the moment isn't that you didn't update Trello. It's that you made a commitment to me to execute our plan. I trusted that you would do so and it didn't get done. That's a more significant issue for us to discuss. If you care so much about Trello, why don't you update it? Again, the primary concern at the moment isn't Trello. It's the trust in our relationship. What do you think was the obstacle that prevented you from following through on the plan? I just didn't feel like it. I feel that our relationship hasn't been as strong since I was named project manager. I heard that you applied for the position as well. Does that have anything to do with this? Maybe. Certainly hasn't been easy watching you in the position I wanted. So 15 minutes goes by. I'm glad that you have the confidence to share that with me. That's not easy to say. I feel that when you applied for the position, you took it away from me. I guess I'm telling myself a villain story, aren't I? Perhaps. I, I didn't apply for the role to keep you from getting it. I did apply because I thought it was how I could best help the team. I know, I know. And while I know I should have a team player mindset, it's still really hard at times because I really wanted that role. It's totally normal to feel that way. You know, you are making a huge difference with your input on the chairman's essays. 
and the things that you have learned about the mystery mechanism, big role or not. Thanks. I may need some help to make sure I don't fall into a victim or villain story in the future. And that is the end of the fourth act. In the example, how did they use crucial conversation skills? How did this help them to build relationship? And how did this help them to build trust? Uh, Mr. Schmidt, you have the actual conversation available. Yeah, so in your um, handout materials all along, and, and for this example as well, you'll see the hyperlinks to each of the acts. So you'll be able to click on the act for uh, focused and flexible um, to be able to review that script for this breakout. Excellent, thank you. All right. And we have the we have the uh, the make it safe uh, pieces showing up on the screen as well. So go ahead and break us out. All right, here we go. So um, let's see some hands raised in the example. How did they use crucial conversation skills, Mr. Spitzner? I'm sorry, that's your dad, Alex. <laughs> Hold on, you got muted. <laughs> I threw you off. I'm sorry. Those are big shoes to fill. Um, I just we just talked about how we thought it was cool that both, like, even though like it got a little like tense, they both like calmed down the situation, and they were both putting, um, they were both just putting effort into the conversation, and they're both being feelings and emotions, and they weren't letting it affect it too much. And then one sentence that I really highlighted was like when Mr. John says, I'm glad that you have the confidence to share that with me, like, that's not easy to say. So he's, like, confirming um, Mr. Schmidt's, like, feelings, and he's not, like, trying to dismiss them. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Connor, how did this help them to, to build relationship? Um, so I thought it was really important that um, Mr. John didn't, like, accuse Mr. Schmidt of anything during, like, the um, act because I think it really allowed Mr. Schmidt to open up about what like was truly like preventing him from getting the test done. And I just thought that, you know, it allows their relationship to stay healthy in the future because Mr. Schmidt now knows that Mr. John is like compassionate towards him and that he's empathetic towards him. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And Andrea, how did this help them to build trust? This helped them build trust. Uh because with the crucial conversation stuff, they're able to not hate each other after the conversation and they'll develop their relationship. Excellent, very good. And Lulu and Simi, my apologies, we won't get to talk to you today or at this one. Um, all right, thank you all. Uh, we are moving on to slide 33 of 41 with four minutes left. We can do this, all right. In the larger culture where we've grown up, there's a strong emphasis on celebrating big accomplishments. Generally, the person who is in the right place at the right time to save the day gets many accolades that are often over the top. But what about the people who day in and day out show up and get the work done? The people who routinely reduce the risk of failure by following the work processes. When they see that save the day person reaping the rewards of being lucky, this might cause their motivation to falter. You know, this becomes a social motivation issue. And if your organization only celebrates these lucky people, then it's a structural motivation as well. So when you read this line at the top, when things go right, praise more than you think you should and then double it. We don't mean throwing huge parties. We do mean finding ways to praise people for doing their job well ways that will motivate them to keep doing good work. Some of the people who do this job well regularly set aside time to look for things that they can praise. And they'll also make sure to create the appropriate social influences by celebrating individuals in private. Um, let's go to act five. I think it's good 
not to skip this. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right. So thank you for updating the Trello card for your story. Your notes made it faster for me to preliminary plan for our next sprint. You're welcome. And hey, thanks for labeling the custom motor mount and putting it in the tote. That made it really easy for the new members to get started on today's task. Sure thing. By the way, I had an idea on how to make our sprint planning meetings more efficient. Oh, wonderful. What's your idea? That was the end of act five. All right, did you notice how celebrating Mr. Schmidt's following the process part also led to him feeling comfortable enough to offer a suggestion? So in this breakout, we want you to think about the kinds of things that we do not currently celebrate, but probably should, and how we could celebrate those things gone right. So there doesn't have to be a lot of discussion, but I hope that there's a lot of typing. There's a Google form, the celebration form link right there um, to populate a document that we can then use as a KFT prior to start of the season. So we can figure out how to start appropriately celebrating and reinforcing the good choices and actions of people and teams. All right, we are gonna run five minutes over. We're gonna have a three minute breakout room. Go. All right, here we go. Okay, so you guys, if, you're, if your groups were anything like mine, you came up with a whole bunch of great ideas. That's awesome. Um, congratulations. We've made it to the summary of the crucial accountability presentation. Here in one flow, you can see all the steps from there's a problem, determine the source, figure out if you have to make it motivating or make it easy. When you're done with that, ask, are there any other sources? Go back, do it again, come up with the plan, the follow-up, and celebrate. And for those of you who don't like flow charts, here is a play on words. How do you get from accountability in action to accountability in action, you just have to add a space. Seek their true issues, provide room for them to see the problems and develop solutions. Accept their solutions, even if they're not perfect. Celebrate their work and earn their trust. So just like last week, man, this stuff is not easy. And it's not supposed to be easy. You guys are gonna have to work at it and you're gonna have to support each other in working on it, right? You can learn to look when you're in the middle of a conversation and you can learn to look when you're watching somebody else have a conversation and maybe provide them a little bit of mentoring afterwards uh, if, if there's some help that it might be useful to, to share. Um, this is, this is huge that so many of you on your team have gone through this. Uh, it's another key advantage that your team has over so many other teams that so many of you are aware of these skills and it makes it easier for us to practice the skills, hold each other accountable and build strong relationships. The last thing I wanna say is you should take this knowledge and apply it to all of your relationships. This will give you more opportunities to practice you'll also be able to reap the rewards of deeper trust and better relationships across all facets of your life. Once again, I ran out of time for questions, but I'm really glad that I got to share these two books with you guys. Next up in our workshops, next week, we have Risk and Project Management, which is being prepared by Mrs. Kama, Mr. Gosar, and Mr. MG. And then we'll be getting into the vision and goals on November 15th. Mr. Schmidt, anything else? That sounds great. Thank you so much, Mr. John, for uh, leading us through this this evening. Thank you again for your help in making it what it was. It's, I really appreciate that. So five minutes over. My apologies, everyone. Uh, you get to sleep in an extra five minutes tomorrow. You can tell your parents I said so. <laughs>